Hi, everybody. Good to see you all here today. Um, and I'm so happy that uh, we get Martha here today, right, as we're looking out the window and beginning to see those weeds come up. But uh, our speaker, <laughs> Martha Lev Molnar, is a freelance writer, author, and commentator. She's published three books. Uh, she's written many essays, which have appeared in several books and in many publications, such as Northern Woodlands Magazine, Green Mountain Club Magazine. Martha's commentaries have been regularly aired on Vermont Public Radio. Um, and in fact, tomorrow in the Boston Globe, uh, Martha will have a piece, once again, addressing weeds. So uh, Martha came, um, well, early in Martha's career, she lived in New York City and wrote, was a writer for the New York Times. Um, while living in New York, she earned a certificate in botany from the New York Botanical Garden. Um, and then in 2008, as her family was grown, she and her husband fulfilled a lifelong dream of moving to Vermont. They purchased a parcel of land that was an old abandoned apple orchard. And they were challenged but very determined to turn this into a beautiful meadow as a haven for birds and wildlife. Along the way, Martha found herself delving into history, botany, environmental science, stories told by the locals, and the deep question, what is a weed? And this was the basis for her third book, which is Playing God in the Meadow, How I Learned to Admire My Weeds. So with that, I'd love to welcome Martha to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Liza. Can you hear me? It's magic. I'm not near that. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, as um, Chris mentioned, this is my third book. Um, the first one was uh, about our move to Vermont, how we built a house, how we started a garden, how we started the meadow, and it's called Taproot because really by now we have very deep roots in Vermont. It's been 15 years, which I know for locals is totally meaningless, but uh, it's long for us. We have moved around. Um, and I realized uh, in writing this book that all three books, my second book was self-published, and it's about my family. Uh, it's available on Amazon, but it's not. It's very different from the first book and the third book. So I realized uh, when I wrote this third book that all three of them have one thing in common. They are all about plants and people moving around the globe. Um, I was an English major, so I am not a scientist. Uh, but I did, as Liza mentioned, I'm sorry, as Chris mentioned, that I do have a certificate in botany from the New York Botanical Gardens. And that has been a great help, not so much in identifying plants, which is what I thought I would learn, but in understanding how plants live and what helps them live, and why they don't live well. Um, so that's been very helpful. And the title of the book really tells, the title and the subtitle really tell the story of the book. The beginning is the title, which is playing God in the Meadow, because when we first had the meadow, I felt like a goddess. Um, somebody at one of my talks asked, my husband was there, and after I finished, he asked, he said, how does it feel to live with a goddess? And I said, well, I'm not one anymore because I've learned that I have to learn to admire my weeds because I really can't win. So I'll, I'll get into that a little more now. Um, the, t the subtitle, How I Learned to Admire My Weeds, is a bit of a stretch. I, would, I wanted to say accept my weeds, but the publisher insisted on admire, so I said, fine. I'll try to learn how to admire them. Okay, so in the beginning, I, I just put that there because I like that painting. But in the beginning, we, we purchased um, a large piece of property was 40 acres in Castleton, Vermont, which you might know. 
uh, cute little village. We never paid attention to the village. We never knew even that there is a university there. All we were interested in was getting our land, and we finally found our land. And it was covered by about 5,000 apple trees that looked like that. <laughs> and uh, we had no idea that the apple trees were dead or dying. And we had no idea that having 5,000 5, apple trees is really a liability and not a plus. Um, but we found that out after a couple of years. And we had the apple trees removed. Um, removed is the wrong word. Uh, the way they did it was this giant orange brontosaurus came. And it just kind of chewed down on top of every tree. And in five minutes, it was nothing but wood chips flying around. It was really something to behold. But when they were done, this is what was left. And um, I had no idea that this would turn into something beautiful. Uh, I was really bereft and terrified that, you know, we've now gotten rid of the apple trees and we have this horrible looking bare ground. But in a very short time, this is what the grass grew into. And you can't tell here, but the, the, when the grass is at its full height around August. It towers above me. So it's really wonderful. And after the grass came the wildflowers. And um, they came, they grew and grew and changed. But it was always beautiful. Um, those little boys are now 13. And they're not quite as cute. But um, well, I still love them. But you know, 13 is. A selfish age, I would say. Um, anyway, they, my family loves the, the meadow, and we love the meadow. And uh, it doesn't quite look like that anymore. But I'll tell you about that in a minute. So then the birds came. Do you know what this is? They came the very first season after the trees were cut. Those are bobolinks. And they're the, I think they're the most wonderful birds. I'm a little partial to them because um, they come by the hundreds to our fields. And um, the reason they come is because they, are, they, don't, they don't have a lot of real estate that they can use. Um, what happened is that what used to be fields in Vermont and probably in surrounding states too became forests. And they live in high grass. That's where they make their homes, in tall grass. And even the fields that are left are being... Uh, cut three times a year or more. So if you're a bobolink and you built your nest in the grass and laid your eggs in the nest, you can imagine what happens to you when the grass is cut. There are some programs out there to pay farmers to not cut the grass three times a year, but you know, they're, they're small programs and the birds have a hard time. So um, we have clouds of them that fly up when I walk the path. It's really quite wonderful. And the Audubon Society, I don't know if you know about it, but the Audubon Society is coming to visit the bobolinks on June 3rd. So if you're a member, you'll hear about it. Um, and then, well, I don't know what's going on there. Flowers came. Do you know what this is? Knapweed. No, it's knapweed. Oh, yeah, it's na it looks like aster, but it's knapweed. And blackberries. And goldenrod. And each of these is very interesting in the beginning. You know, they look pretty. The knapweed looks pretty. The blackberries, of course, have wonderful fruit. And uh, the goldenrod is a native plant that, that um, insects and butterflies love. But each of these is very invasive. And they are a problem. The biggest problem, though, came when this plant moved in. Do you know what this is? Huh? Parsnip. Yeah, it's poison parsnip, exactly. Um, and these are some of the headlines that relate to poison parsnip. That wasn't me, but it could have been me. 
because that's what happened to me. I had no idea what these things are. The first summer there was a small clump and I actually went out, it was a rainy day, and I picked some and put them in a vase. They're beautiful, they're very exotic, very big. I thought they were wonderful. The next summer, of course, there was a whole hoard and I realized that these plants are not really wonderful. So I was out there not wearing, not covered from head to toe as I should have been. And um, I felt a lot of burning on my skin and I didn't know what it was. I thought, well, it's hot. And this went on for about half an hour until I figured I better go look. And when I pulled up my shirt, it was second degree burns. So then I looked it up and I realized what it was. But they really are quite something. Um, if you don't know what they are, it's quite a shock. So we got a lot of these. And then we got even more of these. Do you know what this is? Canada thistle, yeah. Canada thistle, which doesn't burn you, but in some ways it's worse because a parsnip you can sort of dig out or pull up if it's small enough and if the ground is wet. A Canada thistle you cannot pull up. You can't cut it, you can't dig it, you can't pull on it because if you leave, because it, it propagates underground mostly. And so no matter what you do, if a tiny root hair is left in the ground, a whole new plant or plants grow from it. Uh, sometimes it felt to me like um, you know, they literally expanded overnight. Um, so these two plants really launched me into some really frenzied research. Uh, my husband, I have, people say the book is funny because we have some, one of the funny things is we have some interesting exchanges there because I am the gardener. My husband, um, he's happy to eat the vegetables and he likes looking at the flowers but he doesn't particularly want to, he says he likes to garden, but he doesn't like to weed. <laughs> so that tells you <laughs> that he doesn't want to garden. <laughs> um, he was not w on board with me for a long time, but eventually he did get on board and there's some funny exchanges here. So the research that I did was very puzzling because there is not even a definition of what a weed is. Um, there are a lot of, is it a non-native plant? Is it an, can a native plant be a weed? Uh, does it have to be invasive to be a weed? Uh, does it have to want to take over everything to be a weed or can it just hang out by itself and is it still a weed if it's not where you want it to be? These are all questions that are not really answerable. Uh, however, there are a lot of so-called non-native plants that we like. I mean, there's apples and hydrangea and um, ivy, like English ivy, which in the, my daughter lives in, in Portland, Oregon, and um, ivy is a real weed there. Um, we think it looks very classy on certain buildings, but they can't, they try to tear it out of everywhere because it takes everything over. So there's not a clear definition. And we don't even know if weeds are really bad, and I'll get back to this in a minute. What was, the, the research was not only puzzling, it was also kind of disturbing because these are some of the words that I use to refer to weeds non-native weeds, not to native weeds. I have not seen goldenrod referred to this way. Um, and when you look at the, these adjectives, some of them are also used for people who are not native. Um, and that was a little disturbing. And uh, since both my husband and I are immigrants, um, we came separately, but still, it kind of really hit home. And um, we don't use these for all immigrants. We only use it for immigrants from certain countries because, of course, we want people to come from Norway and Sweden. We don't really want them to come from Mexico that much, right? So um, there is a sociological aspect to weeds that is reflected in people, and I, there's a lot of that in the book. 
So there was also a, a Nazi connection, which I discovered, which was really interesting. Um, the Nazis had um, uh, passed a, a law that said that no foreign substances may be allowed to live in their forests, you know, their beautiful dark forests. Um, and it didn't take very long to expand that law to people as well. Um, the Nazis, interestingly, were wonderful conservationists. They understood that, um, that they don't want their forests invaded by invasive non-native weeds, which we don't want either. We don't want mustard in our forests because it does destroy our forests. But they actually had a law um, that spoke to that. And um, that didn't really sit that well with me. So the other question is the second question, are weeds bad? And what do you think? Are weeds bad? Are non-native invasive weeds bad? Let's, let's narrow it down. Non-native invasive weeds, do you think they're bad? Generally, I would agree with you. But again, in my research, I learned this. This is a plot of land in Puerto Rico. What happened in Puerto Rico was that um, it was heavily farmed after the uh, rainforest was destroyed, cut down, burnt, whatever. Whatever they're doing the Amazon now, they did in Puerto Rico 80 years ago. And um, at a certain point, uh, agriculture became no longer financially viable. So people abandoned the land, and there it lay just parched under a hot sun with nothing growing on it. And very soon, a lot of non-native invasive weeds moved in. They were the first to come in. There was one called white iris, which, believe it or not, expands 17 acres a year. So these were pretty invasive non-native weeds. But what they did was they broke up the soil that compacted earth. Then the pollinators came because they, now there was something to eat. And soon enough, the natives moved back in. So now we have on the right a forest that's uh, it, it's, it's a result of ecosynthesis, which is the combination of non-native and natives that create a viable landscape that functions like any landscape does. On the left is the beginning of an ecosynthesis forest that is just at the beginning stages, but you can see where it's going to go. The other thing I learned is about non-native invasive weeds is that they really don't replace the um, native plants mostly. Now, there are exceptions. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, there are in, there's enough room, even when it seems that there's no room for more plants, there's still plenty of room for new plants to come in. And so what they've done when they studied what happens to invaded landscapes, they found that while the total number of species increases vastly, the number of native plants really doesn't decrease or decreases very little. Now, the exception to that is are the two plants in our case that I showed you, the Canada thistle and the poison parsnip. The, pro the reason those are exceptions is because they don't really play well with others. They really just want the whole meadow to themselves. And not only would that look not that pretty, not nearly as pretty as what you saw, but also it wouldn't serve the function that it serves for the pollinators and for the, for, especially for the bobolings that come there. The bobolings will not make their nests in, in poison parsnip and in Canada thistle. They make their nests in tall grass and some native flowers. They don't care that there is a lot of milkweed, for example. They will make their nests around milkweed, but they, they like those other two as little as I like them. That's all I can say. So um, this is what our meadow would look like if we allowed it to become what it's meant to become. 
because meadow naturally moves into shrubland, and this is shrubland. And this is one part of our property where we're letting it happen. We are happy to let it happen because it's simply too many acres for us to manage. Um, and I realized something interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who happens to be a botanist, and I was picking her brains, and she gave me lots of good information. I was taking notes furiously. And then she stopped and she said, Martha, I said, what? She said, your meadow is not even native. I said, yeah, how come I never thought of that? Meadows are not native to Vermont. Forests are native to Vermont. And what we are trying to do is keep that land in its infancy. That's its infant stage. We don't want it to move to this stage, which is the teenage stage, the shrubland stage. The adult stage would be forest. So what we're trying to do is stop the natural succession, which yields a beautiful place that the birds and, and the insects love. So do the foxes, by the way. They seem to like our fields. But, um, but which is not really native and not really natural. So we're encountering all kinds of problems that we need to deal with. And our options are not really great. Uh, we can do nothing, but then we'll lose the meadow. It will come shrubland. Um, kill everything is, uh, believe it or not, I actually got that kind of response from some of the experts I spoke to. There's a whole chapter here called Stalking the Experts. And one of them was in the University of New Hampshire, he shall remain unnamed. But he said we need to just start from scratch, just kill everything, plant grass seeds, and start from scratch. And I, I was really puzzled by that. I said to him, well, if we do that, what's going to prevent the non-native invasive weeds and the native invasive weeds and the crab apple trees and so on from coming back in? And he said, well, you just have to keep after them. I said, well, I might as well keep after them now. What's the point of starting from scratch then? I, might as, I already have a meadow. Let's just keep this meadow going. So we did, we, that we did not do. Um, we decided to ignore, and we are ignoring a lot of other things that are coming in. There's multifloral rose, which is very pretty. Um, there is yellow rattle. Has anybody come across yellow rattle? It's a little plant that's got pretty yellow flowers on a stalk. And when it's dry in the fall, it literally rattles when you walk by. It's like a baby's rattle. It's cute, but it's invasive. Um, so we are focusing on those two plants that I mentioned. And um, one, the one thing that we should be doing that we can't do is keep cutting the grass. We can't do it for two reasons. One. It's very expensive to brush hog 30 or so acres every two or three weeks. And number two, if we do that, we are losing the birds. We are destroying the habitat for the birds. So, so the easy thing would be to mow, but we can't do that. So we can't really dig them out, as I said. I tried to get the fire department to use our land for practice on burning, and they turned me down. I don't know why. And we can't, we don't want to kill the grass and flowers. So what do we do? Well, we are out there uh, several months every summer uh, between June and September, both of us doing what we can by hand. And, and we are keeping, we're keeping the meadow going. Uh, we are successful to the point that we have vanquished most of the poison parsnip. It's really just, there's very little of it left. Um, the Canada thistle is really much more difficult to get rid of, as I said, and we're still battling that. And um, the outcome is not clear yet. So why do we do all this? Well, because I showed you it's beautiful, right? and because we provide a home to all these creatures. We have, when people say they haven't seen a monarch butterfly all summer, I just keep quiet because we have so many milkweed and therefore so many 
monarch butterflies, um, it's worth doing it just for them, right? So these are the, this is what I just said, so. In the process of doing all this, I have become a much more patient God who learned to ignore a lot, accept a lot, and be happy with what we have. And I can do some little reading or I can take questions. Usually people have a lot of questions, so I'll give it some time. Um, so you don't mow at all? We do. We do. We brush hog at the end of the season. In October? Yes, October. And the bobolinks have The bobolinks are only here for about six weeks. Okay. They're only here for about six weeks. They come. Well, here's a mystery. I don't know if there are birders here. I'll just hold it. Um, in the beginning, when we first moved here in 2008, I was told the bobolinks will arrive at the end of about early June. They now arrive about the middle of May. And what I'm wondering is how they know they are in Brazil. How do they know that spring is here earlier? So they come around the middle of May, and they're sort of gone by early July. By July 4th, they've left. Very efficient. Do they go north? No, they go back south. They go back south in yeah. July? Yeah. Wow. I'm not a birder, but bir birds don't leave because they don't have room. They leave there's, there's, because there's more food and le more, less competition up here. That's why they come here. And I guess by the time they are done, the babies are fledged, they are ready to go back, and there's le less competition down there because all the birds are up here. <laughs> I mean, if birds think logically, I don't know. More questions? Question? Um, two, uh, two bad words, ticks and goutweed. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, how, how do you, in your meadow, uh, deal with the tick situation? And I suppose goutweed is more of a uh, garden lawn problem. So you may not have to deal with that in your, in your meadow. We don't have gout weed in the meadow, you're right. We do have it in the perennial garden and in the vegetable garden, yeah. As far as ticks, we live a dangerous life. We pay no attention because we really can't. We really can't be out there all the time dressed in the middle of summer, covered from head to toe. So we just take our chances, we've each had um, Lyme disease once. We both caught it on time, and we got the treatment, and we were done with it. And we'll probably have it again. Um, I mean, I, in the, the first time I got a tick, I thought it was, and I didn't know it was there. It wasn't a deer tick. It was a regular tick. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. Actually, my son got it. Um, and this was, this was before we even moved here. And it was on his scalp, so I couldn't see it for a long time. By the time I saw it, it was like that big, and it was all kinds of colors. And we lived, I mean, by the time we got to the doctor, I was a complete wreck because I thought this was some rare form of cancer. I had no idea what it was. Since then, I got so comfortable with ticks that I just pulled them out regularly out of myself. I don't even tell my husband, come do something. You know, it's like I can do it myself. And we just live with it. We, we shower. We, uh, when we built the house, we put the first thing, one of the first things I insisted on was an outdoor shower. So I jump in there two or three times a day, and that helps a lot. But other than that, as I said, we live a dangerous life. Question, more questions? Well, that you can pull. You can dig out and pull. So, if, But you have to be dressed. You have to wear, you know, long pants, socks, long sleeves, gloves, and you pull it out, and it's doable. It's a lot of work, and it, of course, you always work at it. You're, you're always doing it during the hottest days in July, right? 
but that's, that's when they are at their best, and you want to get them before they flower, before, the, before they seed. Um, and, you know, you get really, really good at recognizing these two plants and others, too. I mean, I can, I can see the tiniest leaf even while I'm driving by. I'm that good at it. Right. So if you do it on an overcast day, it's even safer. Right. Sorry, you had a question. What do you do with it after you pull it out? How do you? Nothing. I mean, they're not, they're not going to grow anymore. We haul them away. We have an old truck. And I don't have pictures here, but the first few years, we filled that truck bed full four or five times every season with pulled parsnip. That's how many we had. It, it's really incredible how quickly they proliferate, how they go from a small clump of maybe 12 plants to 200 or 2,000 in one season. It, it's really unbelievable. So we pulled four or five truckloads each summer. We just take them to one place and dump them there um, next to the barn and uh, leave them there to dry in the sun. Have you intentionally started any Vermont natives in the meadow? I have tried. Um, you know, you have all these wonderful uh, wildflower seeds that are sold, and it seems so wonderfully easy. You just take these <laughs> seeds and <laughs> fling them around, and you have this just like the picture, right? All these great flowers, a flowery meadow. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Unfortunately, the only way you can get flowers, most of them, is to actually dig in plants. And the, the meadow is so full and so difficult. The, the, the roots are probably at least a foot down and very massive that there's, it's almost impossible to dig anything in. But whatever is growing here that's already there is native. And we have a lot of those. But, you know, putting in, there is a section on the book where I speak to people who install meadows. And installing a meadow is extremely expensive if you're going to do it right. They charge many thousands of dollars per acre. And the reason they do that is because it's a lot of work, uh, because they actually have to clear whatever is there. And then they have to dig up the place and till it. And then they have to in, pl put all, plant all these plugs in, which are expensive. And then they have to come back for the first three years and make sure that things are going well. And they, don't, they, they will not do it if you don't hire them for the long term, because if you're not there to really keep an eye on what's happening for the, in the beginning, it's not going to be a meadow. And so it's not as simple as just flinging some seeds out. Uh, there's a big expense involved. you can see in the spring, things are growing, and it's supposed to be all natural. How does it look? Well, so there's nothing blooming yet. But, but in the previous years, did, did, did it look pretty? Well, this is the first spring, Okay. So I'll be curious to watch. It's not far from where I live, so. Okay. Um, if you do that, usually it doesn't look all that great, unless you really do it the way I just said, you know, right, by right. planting plugs and keeping an eye on it and watering them. And right. just like any other plant you'd put in, it yeah. takes that much. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Do I have time to read? Okay. So... Here's a section where I am 
We've had some problems with our neighbors because our neighbors don't see the problems we see. Um, and so this is one section where we go to see a neighbor. The second year, we tried to enlist the neighbors, not in helping us on our turf, but in waging war on their own. So their mustards, this was the beginning. We got mustards, or charlock, as they're called in the field, which I thought were really terrible. But in fact, those were the beginning of the invasion. They are nothing. They just pull right out. And you can even eat them. So I didn't know that those were the good weeds. The second year, we, OK, so. Um, the elderly couple had seemed welcoming. We had visited them in their home, and they had been to our cabin, where they had sat in the uncomfortable kitchen chairs for an interminable time as we valiantly attempted to find common ground for conversation. So I felt confident this conversation would yield excellent results. Ted, that's my husband, thought otherwise. They don't care like you do. They are used to just living with whatever comes. They don't have your energy. They won't even know what you're talking about, he argued. I found that thought impossible to entertain and asked that we at least try. He joined me when we drove up their driveway and waited in the car for the requisite five minutes. After the neighborly pleasantries, I launched into the topic. We wanted to talk to you about the mustards in our fields. The mustards? He asked, looking genuinely puzzled. You know, the yellow weeds growing everywhere. There, there, and there, and there, I pointed triumphantly through their window. As I suspected, their field looked much like ours. They looked and looked and looked some more, and they said nothing. The silence weighed uncomfortably. I looked at Ted. Would you like to come outside for a minute, he ventured. It wasn't the assistance I was looking for, but at least there was action as we all filed out. I bent down and yanked out one of the offenders. This is the mustard I meant, but I'm sure you're familiar with it, I began, ready to launch into the grave consequences of ignoring them. It has a taproot, I pointed out, so if you let it just grow and grow, its root will continue to reach down into the earth until you won't be able to pull it out. They nodded silently. And each of these flowers, it's an inflorescence, you see. Each of these flowers is actually made up of all these tiny flowers. So I continued turning the flower head toward them. So each of these will turn into a seed pod, and each will hold about three dozen seeds, each of which will turn into a new plant. And each of these plants can make thousands of seeds. I ended with a flourish. I felt I'd made my case. We waited. Another long silence. You're pulling these out, he asked. <laughs> All of them, his wife echoed. Another long pause followed our affirmative answer, after which he looked at her, shook his head, and looked down at his boots. Well, he began, then allowed too much time to pass. We just plan on cutting them all down when we brush hog in a couple of weeks. That'll take care of them weeds, she agreed. There's a lot I wanted to explain about the bobolinks and the red wings and their nests and the eggs in the nests and the embryos in those eggs and these birds shrinking habitat here and in their wintering grounds and the perfect storm that's decimating them and why we cannot, should not ever brush hog, at least not until the babies had fledged and realistically not until they all leave on their return flight. But it was not my place. These are kind, decent people who are doing things the way, and the, the way they and the generations before them have always done them. We know nothing about their hardships and their thoughts, their history and their ideas. With our ridiculous worries about birds, birds for heaven's sake, we are as foreign and invasive as the weeds we are bothering them about. So we return to our mustard to battle alone. And this is a description of the two of us weeding. Weeding is like house cleaning. There's the dirt you see and the dirt you uncover as you clean. Here, there were the yellow heads you could spot from the house gazing down through the meadow, and the uncountable small ones you couldn't ignore once you bent down to yank a large plant. 
Thus, the area we set aside for the day's work was never, ever completed. We started out together, but mostly worked alone. Sometimes we met at the corners of our rectangles or walking to a common pile to deposit the pulled carcasses. Often we worked at opposite ends of the meadow. It was best to work alone because weeding some 20 acres of poison parsnip does not make for friendly conversation. <laughs> it consists mostly of nonverbal communication, a blend of my whining and moaning, and Ted's cursing in multiple languages, most of which he doesn't speak. It's possible some are not languages at all, but I could tell they were curses by the not-so-subtle body language and the tone of voice. These were elicited by the worst offenders, the parsons that had grown so massive that large implements were needed to pry out the roots. Also, and here's another example of parsnip's duplicity, the regular breaking off of the smallest ones in the middle of their weak root, which left in the ground would produce a new plant. The best were the average size plants. With the proper grip at ground level, these could be yanked out whole. Often the yank demanded so much energy that I ended, landed on my backside with a trophy in the air, a tortured yell escaping. This meant I missed out on the satisfying whomp, the sound of relief, of emptiness, the grateful gasp of the earth's yielding up the noxious root, and the low crunch as the root is drawn up through the earth. With the stalk in the air, I also missed out on the satisfying weight of the soon-to-be-dead monster in my arms. Its pliant drape, its heavy flower head already losing its vigor. And then I continue for a while. By the way, there's a whole lot of scientific um, information here, but it's not separate from the story. So it's embedded in the story in a way that, um, that is more interesting to read, frankly, than reading straightforward information. It's not a how-to book, although you do learn a lot about the biology, the botany, the history of weeds, and what can and can't be done with them. So I'll read one more little section here, which is at the very end. Um, this chapter starts out saying, day to day, the meadow and I remain locked in an uncomfortable embrace. Every day, I wrestle with it. On some days, I wrestle meaning from it that shapes my understanding of life, mine and the meadows, as a process of continual change. And this is something that I talk about a lot in the book, that nature is not static, and whatever we try to impose on it, um, it, will not, it will only take for a short while, and we have to be accepting and ready to accept continual change. And that's, that's what I'm struggling with. Uh, because I like the meadow just so it looked in that picture with the two little boys. I want it to look like that forever. And that's not, no matter what you do, nature doesn't do that. So, um, I, and then I talk about how what, there were lots of ice ages. There wasn't just the one we all talk about. About 11,000 years ago, there were many others before that that shaped the land. And each, after each ice age, plants moved back in. And they may have been somewhat different plants, but nature created something beautiful each time. So, with each ice age, plants moved great distances because they had to, and because it's easier and faster to migrate than to evolve. Wherever plants moved, they created nature, quote-unquote. Everything alive today is here because plants grew and made seeds that grew into new plants, which grew and sometimes evolved into something new and wonderful, and, or something destructive but possibly necessary and certainly natural. Even today, when our human footprint is enormous, nature not only survives but remains beautiful, complex, vital. I have neither the ability nor the right to interfere in this process, except in a few select cases and for only so long. We don't know what miracles lurk in the genes of what lives today, nor how these miracles will create another kind of nature, because change is in the genes of everything that lives. The meadow will soon become something else. Time will erase all trace of us in our work without ill will or intent. 
The land will become what it was meant to be. We won't live to see this because our human time on this tiny spot of Earth is immeasurably short. We will be gone in less than a blink of geologic time. But evolution will march on. Nature will evolve into a different nature. Humans will be supplanted by what? I would place my bet on crows. <laughs> Having spent many hours watching them, I'm convinced their intelligence is not far behind ours. Our demise would give them the chance to evolve into Corvus sapiens. For now, I try to look around instead of ahead. We are creating beauty for us and abundance for all that lives in this meadow. That is a positive act, an act of defiance in the face of all that is wrong with the world. It's as good a way as any to spend our days. I continue to play God in the meadow, but I will try to be a more modest, more respectful, accepting, and more forgiving God, one with a longer perspective. Thank you.